Hello everybody, um, Tom Matuska here with Matuska Tax Service Supply Company, Thursday afternoon live here with Brett Wingfield. And uh, we're gonna try to, this is deer season, we're gonna try to show you some new things. And uh, what did we talk about last week? Oh man, what did we? Well, we just came back from a vacation last week. Long so vacation. I don't remember. Uh, and uh, we got uh, some new products to show you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, catalogs coming out soon that should hit the new newsstands uh, very soon. And as soon as that does, um, we will be demonstrating a lot of lot of new things. We've got a. Uh, almost 500 new products, I think, in our catalog. That's it's getting time. to be a big book. It's getting to be a real big book. Uh, but anyway, there's lots of new products um, that we're gonna show you. But today, um, we wanted to talk about, this is deer season, and tax service across the nation are taking in white tail mule deer. Antelope season's kinda over, but um, they're probably still coming in. And it's important that you get started right. Uh, a lot of taxidermists are so involved in taking in volumes of work that they kind of um, accuracy and anatomy take a back seat. So we kind of want to show you a little bit. Um, we hear, I field calls every single day that the tannery did this and the tannery did that. And um, the poor tan, kind of when I got started, uh, my instructor said, you know, Blame the tannery because if something doesn't come back right, it's the tannery's fault. Well, sometimes it is, but more often than not, it is um, kind of sometimes hunter neglect, but oftentimes it's the tax service who think they're doing things right and kind of space things off and, and cause themselves headaches in the end. So we're going to just touch on some of those things. This is going to be review for a lot of you. Uh, we're not going to cape a deer today, but we do have a deer and we're going to kind of talk about caping a little. Um, if you want to see, I think, man, maybe a year and a half ago, if you go back to our Facebook archives, uh, you can look and I think we showed you a lot of what we're showing you today too. But this is going to be new and improved and fresh in your mind. So um, we'll show you just as, as a customer comes into the, into the shop and a lot of times, um, we'll start kind of out with pricing. People will call me all the time and they'll say, they'll say, what do you get for deer head? And that question, right away, I know they're shopping, they're phone shopping. They're calling tax firms down the street, they're calling me, they're calling tax firms down the street, and they're looking for the best deal. Happens all the time. Now, would you call a car dealership and say, hey, just checking, what do you get for a car? Same question, you know, there's so many different bells and whistles and details and, and uh, poses and wall pedestals and pedestals and so many different varieties, you can't say what do you get for a deer mount. So a lot of tax firms, especially the, the veterans who have played this game for so long, they um, oftentimes I've heard them say, I won't give a price on the phone. If you wanna know what a deer costs, come into my, my studio and I'll tell you what a deer costs. Um, I don't go to that extent, but a couple things that are helped me out is one thing I'll always say is, who am I speaking with? And that kinda, once you know their name, they're, they're a little more conscientious about you know bringing it in. So first thing I'll do is I'll say, um, who am I talking with? And then Bill Brown, you know, okay Bill, here's, uh, here's the deal, I tell you what, um, if, if you're shopping by phone, and I will explain the whole shopping by phone thing, I'll say, if you're shopping by phone, you're gonna find prices from, and I'll give them the low range, all the way up to you know higher range, and then I will say, we get $745, and in order to show you what you're paying for, you're gonna need to come in, if it's at all possible, come in, and I will show you what you're paying for. Because we do a lot to our deer, we spend a lot, on our game heads, uh, you know, we think we do a really good job, but I want to show you. And I'm not going to twist your arm or anything like that. I will tell the people, go ahead and leave your, you know, unless you live 500 miles away, go ahead and leave your deer head hanging in the barn or the garage where it is. But come in and I'll show you, and then I will show them all the different things. I'll show them the nicotine members. I'll show them the carnivals. I'll show them um, the white 
expanded eyes. I'll show them the nostril detail, um, the texture on the nostril, uh, the grooming, the anatomy. You know, I'll show them all that stuff. And then the best thing you can do is say, now go shop. I argue with what you need to know, what a good deer should look like, now go shop. And 9.9 out of 10, they'll, they'll leave it or they'll go home and get it. Uh, so anyway, that's how we handle it around here. So let's assume that somebody brings us a deer, and why don't you grab our little deer right there. Yeah, deer come in every day this week, I think. This is, this is busy, and I see some of you, uh, some of you uh, post your Facebook, you know, pictures. Uh, poor old Garrett Sunran, he can't even walk in his shop. I saw the entire <laughs> floor was covered with uh, game heads. Um, but uh, then they'll always say, you know, how do you want me to skin it? I, you know, if you tell a customer to, where, where should I cut it off? Um, if I say behind the front legs, they'll usually get the front legs mixed up with the ears and they'll cut it off right behind the ears. Uh, so I try to tell them, I like to say, hang them up by the hind legs, tube them out like a sock, go as far as you possibly can, cut up the back of the front legs, go as far as you possibly can, and cut them off, you know, right behind the ears. Now you had one today that, um, came in, and they had the idea of the front legs right, but I think they came around the front of the front legs. Yeah, uh, just so about. I think they're pretty, it's there, it's on the it's back. It's all there, front, and it's repairable, yeah. but uh, people sometimes do things wrong. <clears throat> a lot of people take in whole deer. Uh, a lot of people skin deer out for free for people, you know. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter how, how you do it, just so you get a good cake to work with. And uh, this deer came in, and the first thing we want to do is make sure that we have a good trophy to work with, a good specimen to work with. So, you know, you can, I, I like to always quiz the customer and kind of get a feeling of how he shot it. Um, oh, I shot this on Monday and we blood trailed him Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we found him on the weekend, then you got and then, you know, this goes on and on forever. You can pretty much guess at what you're gonna have involved in a trophy, you know, that it might not be good. Um, best scenario is, I shot him, we got him, I shot him this morning, and you know, skinned him out right away and brought him in, he's fresh. Uh, the fresher, the better, you know, as, as any of you know, um, organic things, and especially, you know, animals like this, can decompose pretty fast. So it's important that we get something really, really good to work with. Um, this, uh, this one came in and we always check for slippage. If there's any question on how long he's been hanging or how long he's laid, um, we always like to check for slippage. And by doing that, you can take your fingers as long as he's thawed. And I'm not pulling hard. I'm just pulling, letting the hair slip through my fingers. But if I get hairs, I'm gonna start checking further. Yeah. And and um, I don't mind pulling a hair or two out. I'm not concerned with that. I am concerned with getting a couple dozen hairs in one, in yeah, one uh, little grasp. And that means that your epidermis is probably breaking down. Um, Slippage is caused from epidermal breakdown. Epidermal breakdown is caused from bacteria growth. Bacteria growth takes, it's like, there's a nursery rhyme like that. Uh, uh, bacteria growth takes two things. It takes temperature, a warmer temperature, and it takes moisture. Now there's enough moisture in any kind of creature. There's enough moisture so you don't have to add moisture to it. Um, temperature means a warm temperature. A deer that was um, harvested when it was 70 degrees out is way more apt to slip sooner than a deer that was harvested when it was 30 degrees out. Um, freezing will halt or arrest slippage. So a lot of times we tell people put them in the freezer and that's helpful. Um, and they, uh, um, so you, you took out one of the environments. You took out the one temperature. 
So this one came in, and just by looking at him, you're gonna check for damage from the hunter, damage from uh, um, the skinner, whoever skinned this. They can do a lot of a lot of damage. Looks like we've got plenty of cape. And make sure you got enough cape. That's important. Brisket. Shoulders are all there. Everything you don't want somebody wanting a uh, wall pedestal and it's <laughs> cut way short. <laughs> um, when I first got first started my business, I was still in my home and. Somebody came in with a deer cut out, cut off like that, and they wanted a full shoulder mount, you know, and, mm -hmm. and you get into those situations too. If there was something really drastically wrong with this cape, there are replacement capes. Yeah, you know? yeah. So you can check with your off customer too. first, and um, always try to match up what you had to what you're getting for them. But wouldn't and that can be that can be difficult matching color and and size. Mm -hmm. um, so once you've determined that the deer's good, you think it's gonna make a good mount. Then I always tell the person, um, I will say, um, we're gonna start it today, we'll thaw it out right away, and we're gonna skin it, flesh it, prep it. If there's any kind of a problem that we see during that process, we'll call you right away. Um, don't wait six, eight months, and all of a sudden you get the deer out and you have a contact with the customer, he's gonna think it just happened. Yeah. So the quicker the better um, when it gets to something like that. So, hand me one of those tags, we'll show yeah. them that. I like to, the minute, the minute an animal comes in, I wanna put a tag on these antlers. A lot of you taxidermists are gonna have more than one person into your shop with a deer at one time. I mean, last year we had three once. Mm -hmm. And they're all sitting there with, with game heads in boxes and if they went and got back in their car and they never saw you tag it, they're gonna be driving home thinking, how's he gonna know mine from those other two guys? So we like to put a tag on them. We use these type. They're made of tie back. You can't rip them, tear them. Um, they're color fast. The, the names and stuff doesn't come off. And this has, most, for most of your states, it's gonna have everything that your state requires. It's got the name, it's got the address, it's got uh, a room for license number, if your state requires license number, species, date of kill, number of, anything that, that most states require is on here. As well as a signature. And most a signature. Require a signature. Yep. And what I like to do is I like to fill that out with a, like a ballpoint pen or a Sharpie, and then on the back I like to take a big, bigger Sharpie, and I'll write the person's name real big, and then I like to tape it right onto his antlers like that. And that never comes out. If you look at, uh, this is wall pedestal that Brett's been working on here. Um, that has the customer's tag still on it. Now he still has his harvest tags back there also, so there should be no reason to mix up your, your antlers with the poems with the customer. Um, Sometimes when we get it set up like that, we'll actually take the person's name and we'll write it on the back panel. At that point, we may cut these off while we're positioning ears and, and trying to get a, a feel for the attitude for the deer. We don't want a whole, whole bunch of paper hanging on it. But generally, we don't take one tag off until we have another one on. Yeah, we really don't. Uh, the worst thing you can do is mix these up and we try to do everything we can that that doesn't happen and no matter how careful you are, sometime, somewhere, it's gonna happen. All right, do you wanna proceed and tell them a little bit about what we do with this now? Yeah, do you wanna take some measurements? Sure. Okay. Why would you take measurements? I can order that That's in the catalog and the measurements are already there. You absolutely could. There are so many available forms today. Um, at one point in time, we didn't have a lot of selection, but today with available forms, we've got, um, especially for a white-tailed deer, we can, we can order something that fits very, very specific to this deer. So before we take them apart, this is probably the very best time to, to get a few of the critical measurements, and we'll go ahead and record them. Oftentimes, we'll put them right on the tag and on a measurement sheet as well. So I'm just gonna use a pair of six inch calipers here. And we're gonna take, I don't know, one of the more critical measurements for us um, at this point 
is the eye to nose measurement. And sometimes that's going to show up as an A measurement right there from, you'll feel the front here on the very front of the, the corner of the eye orbit or bone right there in the very front and right, I'm going to squeeze these just a little bit. Um, and right there so that we're not putting any undue pressure on the nose pad, but just touching the surface of the nose. And then we would come back and take that against uh, our tape measure. Our handy dandy Matushka clipper tape. And we are gonna get about seven and a half. Right at seven and a half, just possibly seven and five eighths. I'd say seven and a half. And that's coincidentally when we when we get a deer in from our locale here, um, just looking at this deer and his antlers and his face, I would guess seven and a half. Seven yeah. and a half. You get real good at at guesstimating. If we got a, not that the antler size really coincides with uh, with the nose to eye, but the age of the deer, um, they always say that old people. You know, you've seen these. Old men drinking a coffee in the coffee shop, they got a great big old hook nose, great big ears that hang way down. Um, they say that your ears and your nose are the only things that never quit growing. You're starting to get that. I know, I know. <laughs> I get a little uh, ski nose going on like that. Uh, but uh, it's kind of that way with deer. Um, the older they get, the noses kind of kind of keep going. If if we if if these and you told me that was an eight inch nose to eye, I would guesstimate he's either a really big buck or he's a really big buck that maybe has started going downhill. He's gonna have a lot of mass, he's gonna have a lot of character, things like that. But um, you, will, you will get uh, real familiar with facial measurements. Yeah. yeah. Is it important to take measurements while you're out in the field, when it's fresh, fresh? I, the very best measurements are the freshest measurements. Um, the taxidermist themselves that's going to be in the field with the deer that as soon as it's on the ground are probably going to have the ability to take some super good measurements. Um, the hunters, we would caution them. Um, they're going to want to make sure that the measurements that they take are noted that oftentimes they're over the hair because they haven't skinned them yet. The, the hide hasn't come off the animal, so that's important to know for your taxidermist, did you take your measurements over the hair or or off of the carcass, but um, yeah, the fresher the measurements, the better. Um, I'm also going to take uh, width, the front corners of the eyes, and that's a that's a handy measurement for understanding a little bit more about this face. Um, the very front corner of the eye, right where we took our our initial measurement, our A measurement, um, we're going to go from this corner to that corner. And I can just feel, even though I can't see over there, I can just feel the front corner of the eye orbit, just like that. Um, and that's a, that's a good measurement to have too. So I'm going to record that. We're incidentally putting these on a measurement sheet we showed you last week and maybe a few other times. Um, this is, I think, some of Gary Zaner's yep, original, original Gary Zaner measurement sheets. And we've included that online now, complimentary. You can- And how do they find that? Right on our Facebook page. So right before nice. this Facebook Live video, if you go to our Facebook page, you will find it and you can download it, save it, use it, all that. Just a complimentary. And can they print them off? Yep. yep. So you nice. could print those off and you could actually put the customer's name down there? Yeah. And keep records of that? Yep, there's a place here for um, collected by. There you can put your customer name. You can customize this however you might want to. Um, but we're just going to include some. We we fill these out for a lot. Ninety five percent of the deer that come into the shop, and we fill them out really, um, really specifically. You may only find a couple of these that you want to use, but um, there are some critical measurements here. So this is the E measurement um, that we've included. Yeah, we have call it the E. Yep. Front corners of the eyes, okay. and you'll we see. We include it here. that for our bears, our sheep, yeah. our deer. Um, as an animal gets older, not only 
um, do the lengths change, but also the widths change also. Yeah, they do. And that's yeah. why this is pretty, pretty handy. Um, a, a young seven and a half inch nose to eye is not gonna be as wide as an old seven and a half inch yeah. nose to eye. Yeah. I noticed your measurement chart has a lot of blanks to fill in. How crucial and important are each one of those? Or would well, you the highlight certain? The catalogs ones? that you order from are gonna ask you for an A, which is nose to eye. Um, they're gonna ask you for a B, um, depending on where you look. Um, McKinsey's B is um, three the inches atlas. down behind yeah. the atlas. Um, ours is, and Ohio's is a little different, so you're gonna to wanna to look at their measurement um, chart, their little, yep. their little, I uh, can't remember what you call that, um, that they put on the bottom of maps. Oh, a little key or a legend? Legend, yeah. that's what I was thinking of. Um, so anyway, our B is right here, the C is right three yep. inches down, and then some companies, and I think online, we include the mid-neck measurement. Um, a lot of companies give you a mid-neck measurement, and that's kind of an iffy one because that's tough. who knows where mid-neck is. If you measure mid-neck, and you'd have to have the neck in here to do it, mm -hmm. um, or, or skin him out and measure the neck meat. Um, if you go an inch this way, it's gonna be an inch smaller. If you go this way, it might be two inches bigger. Yeah. So that mid-neck one might get you into the ballpark, but it's a pretty yeah. iffy one. I mean, if they only had one, which one would you recommend? One of which, the neck of measurements? The neck measurements. Over the atlas. Yeah. yeah. And that um, would be ours? Not this one. This, I mean, every deer is going to be 18 inches, you know, right behind <laughs> the ears, kind of. But you go down, and that, that's going to give you, over the atlas, that's going to give you um, a pretty accurate measurement indication of how big that deer really is. If this deer over the atlas is 21, I know that's kind of a big deer because, you know, he's, he's starting to swell up. Yeah. yeah. Pretty good. Um, take as many measurements as you want, even though the catalogs won't ask for those. When you get your cake tanned and you're test fitting him and you think, wow, he's awfully sloppy through here. How come I have so much skin? Um, mm -hmm. Look at your measurement sheet, which you have on file somewhere. Look at your measurement sheet, compare it to the form you bought and it's gonna dawn on you, oh my gosh, that's why. Um, it's very interesting when I first started, um, and I go way back to paper forms, you know, one of the first companies to ever have styrofoam forms was McKinsey, and, uh, but then soon on the, uh, in the competition was um, Joe Combs, and Joe Combs had deer that were beautiful. They had wrinkles, and they had muscles, and they were, you know, very, very detailed. So everybody's buying Joe Combs deer. And I would get Joe Combs deer, so excited to mount on him, and I had so much loose skin, I couldn't, I think I'm a pretty good taxidermist, so I could not taxi it anywhere. Um, I had bags of skin hanging here, and I started cramming in clay and shaping with clay, and, and uh, they were a nightmare to work with. And when Joe Combs first started, um, his deer were all, his mannequins were all sculpted from Louisiana deer, yeah. which were way more petite in the face than our Midwestern farmland deer. And uh, it didn't matter how much detail they had, <laughs> my faces looked pretty darn funny, you know. Um, and now everybody kind of has, you know, they have deer sculpted from different yeah, locations. As somebody said, uh, uh, is Andrew Munlo, and he says, I love your new Sagebrush series mule deer. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I'm a successful muley taxidermist when I use them. <laughs> um, has he tried the new noses? I'm not sure, but his deer looked very, very nice. He said, it, your muley is the closest thing I've found to nature. And I've tried them all. So check out our Sagebrush Series mule deer forms, but that just shows you right there. It would not be that good, just use the right form, right? <laughs> little sneak peek of a new catalog yeah. item. Yeah, look at that. Um, most of our sagebrush, everything I think except the biggest. the biggest ones in the early season, and the early seasons can be made to work, I think, too. But uh, these replacement noses are as detailed as you're going to ever find. Um, 
they have, I mean, if you hold them up, you can see the outline of the nasal passage back here. And uh, thanks to Brian Olson and a lot of modeling by Brett here, um, you can buy your Sagebrush Series mule deer and this will index right in. It does not have a foam nose in it. You can hot glue them on, you can super glue them on, you can, you know, doesn't matter how, you can caulk them on, you can hide paste them on. Um, it's got a ledge in here, I can point. It's got a ledge, so if you thin your deer skin down and you can super glue that skin or hide paste it, it matches up right to a nice textured interior nasal passage all the way around there. Now, how, how many times and how many hours have you spent with a brush in your epoxy oh, and trying to shape a nostril out of there? And some of you get really good at it, but can you get good at, good at it on both sides? Yeah, same I can make a beautiful nostril only to find out I made the other one bigger or smaller. Yeah. Um, look at that, they're perfect. They couldn't be more perfect. Now, if you want to, you can flare these more open. You can put them in hot water and you can, just by bending them carefully, you can flare them out. Or if you wanted to close them down, um, hot water, heat gun, you can press them down a little bit, run them under cold water, and you can reshape that nostril if you'd like it open more or less. Yeah. We have smalls and mediums. The larges are coming. We hope. The white tail are coming. The white tail are like really that's close. Like like the, the, uh, really close. That sounds like the English are coming. I mean, this is. <laughs> we don't advertise these as competition nostrils, but there are not too many competitors that come up with this kind of detail. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it's a. It's a. It's a neat piece. And um, it's easy. And that's just one of kind of the new stuff. We're gonna yeah, see a lot of new catalog, stuff. So. Um, so those measurements are very, very important. Um, take as many as you want. Uh, we've been taking really accurate measurements for, oh man, 30 years ever since we started sculpting and making deer mannequins here or thinking I could make a deer mannequin, which a lot of times I started and never, never finished. But uh, I have, what do we have? Oh man, a couple, yeah. couple hundred. And uh, you will find that in the Midwestern area, our seven inch nose to eye deer, typically 75, 85% of them are gonna be very similar through here. Our seven and a half inch nose to eye deer, 75, 85% of them are gonna be very similar through here. You know, you're gonna dry correlate, draw correlations and be able to come up with some really accurate, typical looks for your deer here. That brings up a, a good point, new products and this, the regionally specific, say the seven inch deer from here, oftentimes that's a yearling. That's a, that's a pretty small deer in our, previously our competitors uh, choice forms were sculpted to fit those deer. Um, can we I'll get this out of your way if you wanna show them another new offering? This is a seven inch most eye. Um, competitor's choice and like you said if we got in a seven inch even a seven and a quarter here um, I'm gonna say ten out of ten times it's gonna have a tiny little basket wrap you know yep. it's gonna be probably a little three by three little you know three by four or something like that um, and and this is just this is a great size deer it's oftentimes you know uh, people's first steer that they shot or mm -hmm. first bow kill or something like that. We do a lot of these. Um, our seven inch nose to eye deer, I'm gonna say almost always run 17 inches by 18 inch yeah. neck. You know, they're they're those little wannabe bucks. You know, yeah. that yeah. the little ones. They think they can, but they can't quite, yeah. you know. Uh, but that's a competitor's choice. Now, we got a call um, a couple years ago uh, by a Southern tax service who said, you know, when are you gonna come out with, Kenny Bauman was one of them, mm -hmm. he said, when are you gonna come out with some decent sized seven inch nose guy deer? And we said, like what? And he said, you know, something 19 by, you know, 21s or so. Well, why would we do that? Because our deer don't get that right. big, but theirs do. 
Um, they get nice mature bucks with nice size antlers, just like the deer you had up here. And uh, they get those deer in, um, and they're only seven inches nose to eye. So those are three, four year old deer. They're yeah. not like our seven inch that's a yearling. So we went down to Andy Steffens, and uh, Andy is a taxidermist in Oklahoma, and he also processes deer. And we measured a lot of deer. And these deer were 90% seven inch nose to eye, but they were considerably bigger deer, and they were also that E measurement was wider. Oh, wider than our typical set. Yeah. And kind of like the seven inch, the older they got, they spread a little bit. So I'm gonna leave this right here just so we can compare. And this is an example of that deer. So that's a product of your trip to Oklahoma. Yeah. And that's and and you know, look at the look at the size. He just looks bigger than that deer. And uh, bigger in the shoulders, and the neck is really very similar, um, but the head is wider. Taller, you'll notice it's taller through here as well. And now, since we've come out with the SW, we've got um, two different sizes in these, and uh, we've had people from, from throughout the South, Louisiana and Pennsylvania, saying it fits their deer perfectly, but it's I guess what we would say is um, a mature seven inch yeah. nose to eye. And it's just a bigger, older deer, and they just have a shorter face. Um, now, did this have any differences in length? The neck length seemed to be, we measured, I think we measured 30 some deer. Um, from the brisket to under the chin here, under his throat, seem to be an inch shorter than anything we get up here. Yeah. Which makes them look a little bit bigger in the neck too. Yeah. yeah. So just a few of the differences in the SW. This is one, that's one of the precision, um, the extreme precision forms. And this is the competitor's choice. Competitor's choice. choice. Yeah. And typically when you get into the competitor's choice, there are our Midwestern deer, they tend to be a little slightly heavier um, in the face. Um, the new XP series, how many do you have? You've got a lot of them now. Um, you know, I made your count last, last week, I think. Um, but uh, they are full featured, they are extremely detailed. Um, they accept ear liners with ear butts on them. They accept buttless ear liners. Um, tear duct, extremely accurate. Um, as far as how the how the anatomy lays, the top lobe lays over the bottom lobe. Um, angle of the eyes is really good. Um, lots of nice detail. Perfect length lip line. Lots of detail in the nose. These are these are great here. And this is an offset semi sneak. They're offset semi sneak. Most of you would know. Um, offset means that if you look at him from the back, he shows more shoulder on this side. Less shoulder on this side. So by turning the body one direction and bringing the head back, we're, up, we're able to allow a nice curve, a nice turn, really but nice. the deer's head is still gracious in the center so of the room. He's actually turned a little bit more than a lot of deer, but because of the offset shoulder, that doesn't make him look off into the corner. Right. Yep. So the offset's a very popular deer. Used to be everybody put, uh, deer on panels and so the offset was not conducive to that very well. Now very many, not very many people use panels and the offset works real good. And compare that to this is a and all the XPs have have the size on them. This is a 19 by 21, seven and a half. And uh, that's the regular XP. So that had, that is not the SW. So that's the it's an inch half. longer and it's a little bit bigger faced. Okay. Both the same nice offset pose. These are really popular. I mean, if you can if you can mount a a deer and and uh, put the skin where the skin goes, you know, align things, taxi things where where it goes, you're gonna find that these 
briskets line up exceptionally well, just like the competitor's choice were known for real accurate brisket alignment. Um, another thing, until I became a mold maker, I didn't know this, um, with a two-piece mold, and the two-piece mold, you're gonna know, has one seam down the back, one seam down the throat. With a two-piece mold, um, you are not able to get this kind of detail. When you start making molds and you try to capture some of this detail and some of the under chin detail and top of the head, it takes three to sometimes even four pieces. Mm -hmm. And uh, we offer that in any of these, any of these forms are at least three piece molds, yeah. which uh, makes mounting a lot easier for you. Two piece molds, we always had to use a sawzall and cut, cut relief hits. cuts up in the armpits and, and you have to put this in because you couldn't get it. So. Um, any of these are a lot, a lot more detailed. So now they've got enough measurements to choose a nice form. Um, should we show them a little bit about what they should do? I think so. Their capes. <laughs> um, so we're not going to do the caping demo today. Again, all of our previous videos are are in the library on YouTube, mm -hmm. um, and we did do a caping demonstration. I've been doing this a long time. It's been a while. A long time. But, in depth. Um, so that's in depth and detailed there. We have a cape that we took off of a deer um, just the day before. And we've got a couple in a few different stages. So um, kind of like the cooking show, we're going to show Which you a few stage of things. Like, I think you want this stage. How about the raw stage? Fresh off. Um, yep. Okay, so now this deer has just been taken off of the carcass. Yeah. So he's actually been taken off. He has, we've done some prep work on this, but we haven't done anything to the body. We've done, um, we've split the lips, we've turned the ears, all of that part has been done. But um, in order to get this deer ready for the tannery, or for the tanning process, we need to remove all the flesh and meat from it. Um, and there are a few different ways to do that. Um, the first being uh, the, the, the bean and nutty. Um, I think this has been done for ages and ages and ages and ages and ages. Um, and then what you do is you, you place your cape. Um, usually, we doesn't matter if you, have, if you flesh them first or turn the ears and lips and stuff. We tend to turn the ears, split the lips. Um, then put them on the beam, and this beam does not conform to this knife, which it really needs to do. Um, and to do that, you're going to buy a knife, or if you have a knife, it's going to have this contour. You really want this beam to match that contour. This is one that we've had around here for years, and nobody ever took the trouble. Um, so what you do, I, I can hardly touch this beam one little spot there, one little spot there. The rest is all air under there, and I, I'm not going to scrape very well um, with this. So what you do is you buy a beam. You would make a stand for it if you want to, and then you're going to take a sander or a plane, and you're going to plane these corners off. You can see I've got down here, I've got a real sharp corner. Look at here. There's air under there. I'm not hitting the edges down here. I'm hitting that corner, and I'm hitting that corner. So I would like to take um, a sander and I would sand these corners off until it conforms to that contour and you're going to find flushing is way easier. And you can make your own beam, you don't have to buy one. Um, these are maple and for some reason um, hard maple is what some of the better beams are made of. Um, these come yeah, in a couple sizes, I think, don't you? And you can put them on a stand like that, or in some way you have to hold these things up. So that's why we tend to make them on a uh, plywood stand. There's a four by four, and then there's a little plank at the end, hold them up at the angle and the size and the height that you want. Customize it to your own height. That's something, if you're gonna go that route, you're gonna want it to fit because it's gonna put some strain on your back. Strain on your back and you get really big muscles and you can tell that I do not use a beam. <laughs> and um, 
before we move on, tell them about ears and lips and stuff and kind of give them an idea yeah. of how, it, how far you go on something like that. Yeah. Um, well, this is a cape that we're, this is a customer cape. So we're going to minimize our work on the after the tannery. You, so we've got this turn quite a bit. Um, or if you tan them yourself too. Yeah, yeah. Um, much easier to turn now. Um, so we're gonna turn the ears inside out, exposing the cartilage all the way to the very edge like this. Um, we're gonna remove all of the meat at the bottom. I um, mean, we're gonna do that on both sides. We're gonna take back any flesh from, from the bases of the ears. You can see that's been done over here as well. I um, mean, it's turned all the way to the very point of the ear. You'll start to recognize um, the proper shape of a, of a deer ear or whatever species you're working with. If this were round, more than likely you don't have it split far enough. You could have a deer with a cropped ear and you'll want to check that from the outside. It's but, easier to do um, now. Yes, much, much easier to do at this point. And so um, our customer stuff, we've done that with. Um, we're also going to, we're going to split the lip and that's a common term I think people hear, but not everybody understands that. When we take this initially off of the animal, the inside of the lip skin is attached to the back side. So we have two sides, we have the hair side and we have the skin side. In order to get salt to penetrate all the way through, we're gonna open this up and butterfly that open all the way around so that it lays nice and flat like this. And then the salt can get all the way through um, this side. Um, worth mentioning that salt can easily penetrate a, a thin layer of meat, but not fat. So we're gonna have to remove all of the fatty tissue from this. Um, but we've gone all the way around. We've split that lip line um, all the way around the bottom and all the way through. You can cut that and trim it back if you wanted to. Now, typically we'll only save about a half an inch of this to tuck, but you can see there's a little over an inch. Um, you can leave it or trim it up now if you want to. Um, we've also split the nostrils. So the septum was here in the middle. That was cut down. We probably could have shortened that up a little bit. Um, but this was originally adhered back to over the top of the nose right here. So the septum come, came clear back to there where the bone quit um, like this. And then that was split, exposing this white tendon. And that's kind of how we gauge how far we're gonna split that is to make sure we expose that tendon, that tendon. yeah. yeah. Um, and then the flesh can be removed a little bit more from here. I mean, you can split those nostril wings further. You can trim up the septum if you'd like to um, take and all the And now nothing's out. protecting this skin right now. Uh, it's still room temperature, still got plenty of moisture in there, plenty of chance for bacteria to grow. Yeah. So time is of the essence when you take this deer cape off of the off of the head sure um, Jacob was asking the other day you know something about how um, how long to, to cape it out and I was out at Marty Hansen Marty Hansen capes deer for a living seven minutes from the time he touches that cape um, with a knife the time it is laying here like this not not turning ears splitting the lips but just getting it off um, that's kind of what you want because that all goes towards your mounting time. The more, the quicker you get at, at keeping him out, splitting the ear, turning the ear, splitting the lips, nostrils, things like that, and salting, now you can breathe. Now yeah. you've got time to work, and you have all that time, you can go into the mounting process, and you can take your time, you don't have to rush. Yeah. So we have to get him to a stable point, and that's what that salt will do. See, um, now that's kind of a mess. What are we gonna do? To clean so, him up. Yeah. Um, I don't want to do that beam. That's too much work for me. <laughs> I'm kind of cute. Um, so we would now we need to remove all of the flesh. There's you can see there's a considerable amount of fat still on here. Um, the beam is a good and 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 uh, usable tool for it. But we also have the fleshing machine, and that is the choice in our shop. Um, we like to. Uh, we like to run our green or raw hides on the machine. Um, it takes a thin layer of meat off. We've kind of talked about this as well in previous demonstrations, but we'll go ahead and show this again today. Um, 
about the machine. This is a machine that we carry. It's American an American Eagle, Eagle by Steve McGee. Um, um, most, this is more of a tanner's tool. It's more used for thinning your hides, um, thinning them down. In order to tan that hide, you want to reduce that thickness of that skin by two thirds, which is a lot. Um, you can't do it with a beam. We have people all the time saying, you know, they'll call them, I'm tanning this deer hide, and I've been having trouble with slippage, and so I go through their whole process with them, and uh, I said, how are, you, how are you thinning your hides? They're either doing it with a knife Ugh. or a mini flusher, which is better, but you, it's pretty tough to tan a hide yourself without a machine like this. But we have found that um, we can make short work and not even mess with the beam and the yeah. effort of the beam with this. Yeah. And it gives a really, it dries our capes. I think our capes dry a little bit faster. We remove that membrane. Um, it does a really nice job. And I, I think our tanneries are happy Happier to see with us. us. Yeah. yeah I want you to show them how it works. Yeah. Um, our goal is to get, we're not necessarily in this step thinning the leather, although we could with the machine. We're, Today we're just going to try to get this membrane, this meat and fat membrane, off and nice and clean. So um, we'll bring it over here to the flashing machine. Um, we're going to turn this guy on. He makes a little bit of noise. The blade, if you're not familiar with these, the blade is turned over. So the sharp edge is on a 90 degree angle and it will have a point that comes down this way and a point that complements that, um, almost like the end of that little black diamond fleshing steel or sharpening steel um, and I'm gonna lay this steel right on the top edge it's a good idea just to make sure that your your blade is nice and sharp so the first thing you'll see me do is I'll come up under and touch the bottom edge and then I'll go over the top and I'll touch the top edge like this just to make sure that it's good and cut and good um, before we get going so under just touch it up You don't want to do that too much because you don't want to create heat that will um, cause you to lose the edge of your steel. Always when you're using a fleshing beam, a knife, or a machine like this, we want to start somewhere that if we did have an accident, if we did cut too deep, um, it would be off the cape. So I'm going to orient this deer so that I know I'm on the back skin. I'm going to use a little bit of salt here. Um, it helps me for grip. Um, Tighten things up, like so. I'm just going to come across here like this. And you can see I'm starting to remove that, that tissue layer. And I'm getting a really nice, clean hide with very little effort. Like so. this entire gear doing just exactly that until this guy is nice and clean having removed all the fat I like to make sure that we don't have a lot of heavy meat or fat before we come to the machine so anything that you can get with uh, your knife will do that ahead of time um, but you can see we're getting real nice and clean now this area here and we would continue through the whole thing you can go right up you can do some detail work if we wanted to um, I've got the face here I'm gonna go just a little bit behind the ears I've got a large area there and you can do the exact same thing all the way up here behind the ears making sure that's nice and clean go right up on top of the head if we wanted to. There's usually a little bit up here you'll want to get. Now this should make the tannery happy if you do a nice job with the machine. Absolutely. Or, real sad, if you don't do a nice job. Um, but we can get this all nice and clean. We 
remove that, all of that tissue. And this probably will take 10 to 15 minutes at the most. Um, doesn't take us very long to go over a cape that's fairly clean. Um, and so we'll go and do the entire deer just like that. Um, we have them right over here. It's like we've done that with. Cooking show. Yeah. <laughs> so this deer has been all done. And you can see he's nice and clean and ready for salt. He has not been salted, um, but his ears are turned. The hide's nice and clean and ready, ready for salt. And and what are your guys' tricks real quick when you send your hides to the tannery to know that they're yours? What's your system? We like to punch them yeah. with a code. Um, let me grab a book. Every customer that comes in the shop, when we get done with that, that deer, um, they get a number. Here's a, this is a, a typical page. It's got the guy's name. It's got a specimen, origin, where it came from, code, which is the number. We like to put a size on there. I want to know, I, I want a little idea of how big that deer is. So we'll put a ruler in him, like the neck measurements. And we already have a nose to eye, like that one that you, we had here. Um, so we will have some of the measurements. That way, if it comes back from the tannery and I'm not even close, I start wondering what happened. Yep. Um, but anyway, that's what our blank sheet looks like. And then, um, so this person was a black tailed deer. There's his name, there's his black tail. Um, he is number 354. And then if I, if I can get a size off him, I like to put a size there. When I order the form, I will write the form number in there. But we have this, I mean, we have pages and pages and pages. Um, we've got cross fox, we've got white tail, we've got mule deer, we've got bobcats, we've got uh, black bears, we've got white goat, um, just all kinds of different creatures. But here's an example, we'll take a, a punch, and we have a punch made specifically for that, but otherwise, um, you want to do a puncture mark. So this one is, this is the hundreds row, this is the tens row, and this is the ones row. So this is gonna be three, there's 300. One, two, three, four, five, 353. So I can go back to my book and I can look at 353 is K. Murray, white tail, hole in the ear, seven and three eighths. And to make the punch mark, we just, push down to the table and pull it up. Like I would push down like this and pull it up and make a punch mark. But there's 353. Now I could have 400, I could do one more punch there. 453. We don't do any more than five on a row. Um, that would be a lot, 500 yeah. and some. Um, we start out with one. One, 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 two, one. The next person's one, three, one. And then after we've got up to five, then we'll go to, you know, one, five, one, one, five, two, one, five, three. But now, no matter, we can lose that tag. That tag can go away and we still have this to rely on. And it'll always stay with that hide. We end up yep. trimming that off probably when we mount the deer. Yep. And we just for safety's sake, we'll punch them twice. Um, You're learning a lot, aren't you? I'm learning a lot. Right. <laughs> um, but that's just good identification. Like we said before, we never remove a tag without having another tag on it. And this punch code is a form of a tag. So that's And a scalpel will work good. The number 11 of scalpel works good. You don't want to have to push so hard that it's near impossible to get a, get a punch through. Um, we like to take an awl, DWL awl, like an ice pick awl, and put it on the sander and sand three sides. So it's a triangle. I saw um, Garrett's little punch that he had. It must have been a homemade punch that he used. Oh, he had it on Facebook last night. But uh, once you come up with something, you want it very sharp and don't lose it. You just keep, punch it on this side, the next side, the next side, the next side. Okay, now show them how you insult that. And how much salt would you use? What kind of salt 
is it? Where does it come from? Tell me everything. <laughs> well, I'll get you we've, some got, we've got salt here that you can get through us. Um, you can also get salt from your elevator. Um, usually it's a, a mixing salt. We like a fine salt. You can use a rock salt or a coarser salt. We just happen to prefer the fine, clean white salt. Um, some people reuse salt, we typically don't. We like to have it nice and clean, salt cheap. Salt is pretty cheap, so. Do you have um, to go to the top floor? Ooh, four, huh? Elevator. No, bottom floor. Um, but very, very important. Um, tell them what the salt's gonna do. I'll, I'll salt this, but you okay. tell them why Remember we're Remember I said um, slippage would cause from epider epidermal breakdown. Um, your epidermis starts breaking down because of two things. Do you remember what they were? Temperature. Gee, you got a question in here. You weren't listening. Temperature um, and moisture. Now, there is moisture in that hide, but the salt will remove moisture. If you salt that hide and lay it on the table, within an hour, body fluids are gonna start running off of the table onto the floor. Salt will wick the moisture out of that hide and remove it and eventually dry it up. Once the moisture is out of that hide, um, the uh, bacteria can't grow anymore. It needs moisture to grow. So even a salted hide can be at 100 degrees for quite some time. Over in Africa, um, when I was there, they salt hides and they hang them and then they roll them up and they're 100 degrees out and they are as safe as can be. Um, so very, very important that we salt it thoroughly because that's to make sure that we remove all of the moisture from the hide, that we don't have spots that don't get it. Um, but uh, probably not necessary to use a ton of salt. Um, a little salt, I think I remember one of the lessons from class we teach students. Um, I remember you telling us, a pound of salt rubbed in is better than 10 pounds dumped on. And that's really true. Um, as long as we're rubbing it in really good, um, we, will, we don't necessarily need a whole bunch of salt to do the job here. So we're just going to, I've worked it around the lip line, around the eyes, bases of the ears is an area that people tend to forget just because it flops over, ear flops over and you forget that spot, but make sure and be very thorough. Um, I did salt the interior of the ear, or I should say exterior, but they're turned. So I've, I've put, half a cup of salt, I suppose, in this white tail ear. I'm gonna rub it around on the inside, making sure that we get that salted really good inside and out. I've gone around the eye. We have the eye skin lifted. All of the tuck skin here is lifted up around. Making sure that I go around the tear duct sometimes if you want to, you can go from the inside around the eye skin too. In my early days, um, I would sand hides from tannery and I would get my deer back and inside of their ears were bare, the hair on the inside of the ears. So I thought, oh, that's kind of funny. This and it was a deer, not, <laughs> not a bear. <laughs> not a bear, it's like, yeah, I did that on a bear too. Uh, but uh, I had hairless ears. And so you gotta give it back to the customer. So I'm thinking, first of all, that deer must not have had hair in his ears. After two or three, it's the darn tannery. The darn tannery is ruining my deer ears. Cover your so, Sam. I would, I would paint, well first you gotta paint white, right? Well, I didn't know the difference between appliance white and flat white, so my ears were very, very shiny on the inside. That didn't look very good. <laughs> then I learned that flat white was better, and then I learned flat white with a little flesh in was better yet, and then flat white with a little flesh in and glue some hair on the inside. Um, I basically was ruining my customer's beer um, just because I didn't know how to save the hair on the inside of the banner or on the inside of the ear. Now, when you saw Brett with the ear, that cartilage, salt will not penetrate that cartilage. So I was salting my ear cartilage really, really well, but it was not penetrating because it's like going through a sheet of cardboard. Okay. So there's actually two layers of skin there that need so to be That's why you put salt. it on the inside, and then you come back with nice, hairy ears. Have you been using the same gloves this whole entire time? I haven't. Mandy, I that didn't even impressive. get a hole in any of them. Look at that. 
Um, I do like these black gloves though. They work pretty well. Tom, I do too, has a glove that he prefers and favors. I have a glove that I favor. We've got the black nitrile. Black nitrile, everybody loves that. They're 50% yeah. thicker. Um, you don't tear holes in them. Yeah, you don't tear holes in them. Um, you can even, we wash our birds in a solvent. You can even wash your birds in a solvent like the, the neoprene gloves, the mm -hmm. latex gloves will fall right off your hands. And um, these work really good. We have a glove for everybody, don't we? Yeah. Um, remember to like and share the video. We'll be picking a winner here shortly from last week. So to get in your chance to win that, share the video and give us a thumbs up. Um, we do this live every Thursday. So for those just joining in, we are live with Tax Remedy Demos every Thursday at 4 p.m. Um, tune in, and if you have questions, you can ask them, and we'll answer them as we go. If you miss it, you can watch the next day, or you can check out our YouTube channel. Now, from a fleshing standpoint, um, I don't know if you can appreciate this online, but this is looking really pretty, and um, I feel very com confident in... Um, you know, yeah. the fleshing and the skinning and everything of that that deer. And I would be amazed if it came back from the tannery with any kind of damage at all. And um, just because of the way we've taken care of it, um, it looks good. Yep. And so at this point, we would probably fold this deer in half, let it set it on a draining rack and let it sweat for, I don't know, an hour. We used to take a, a little kid swimming pool. You gotta get them in the summertime, those little blue swimming pools. And we would put a board in it, like a sheet of plywood at an angle, yeah. and then um, lay that hide on there and all the juices run off. And then usually the next day or after several hours, it's, it's nice to shake off all the old salt and re-salt them one time. And then as they dry, make sure if you're gonna send them to tannery, make sure you'll be able to get them in a box because we had an elk a while back that somebody <laughs> neglected and it stretched out about six feet long and did not go in a box. So we had to rehydrate it just to get it folded up. Yeah. Um, you said Thursday Live. What are we doing next week? Well, that's kind of the thing. So for those of you, we are actually going to be closed Thursday and Friday next week for Thanksgiving. And then it's Black Friday. But um, our employees, we kind of give them the two days to be with their family. So for those of you that need to order something, make sure you order at the beginning of the week if you want it by the middle of the week or whatnot. So give us a call right away. Um, our live next week, we will be doing it on Thanksgiving night and it'll be my dad and I and we'll be going live and we're basically gonna show you some closeout sales. We're gonna show you some new highlighted items. We are gonna run some sales. We are going to um, new items that are with us in stock but they aren't actually in the catalog of your catalog that you're seeing so you can get those one of the things we're doing is on the sale a lot of you if you have let's see we have our catalog um, we do have we'll have an online flip book that you can check out of the catalog and we'll have an online flip book of the sale and it'll take you to your items um, just kind of keep in mind that we have a quick order form that makes it super easy for you guys. It just got updated again last week. But for those of you that know what you want, you know the item number, just go online and type it in and you don't have to go to 10 different pages to find your product. It's just an easy add three to the cart, add one to the cart, done, done. You can print it off for other people in your shop to see if they want to add on. You can have multiple shop people using it. So really take advantage of that because we are going to be closed on Friday and Thanksgiving. So you'll have to be purchasing this stuff online, but definitely give us a call. Caitlin, do you have a winner for us? I do. So I have Mark Barber. If you are present, please comment in. We are giving away the record keeping system today, if I am correct. So that was Mark Barber. Give him a... That's something we didn't touch on. We kind of talked about tagging and things like that, but uh, most states, not all, but most states, you're gonna wanna have records of your animals in your freezer, and you're gonna want a tag like this that goes, is attached to the animal, and that should correspond with a page in your record keeping book. Can you open that up and show us? 
Right, and the second one is Craig Stoken. I'm not sure Mark is present right now. So Craig Stoken, if you are live, please come in and let us know. Otherwise, we will go to a number guessing. So Mark or Craig, let us know why they're showing, and otherwise we'll go to a live viewer. So keep watching, guys, and one of you can get this. Um, these are the record-keeping books. Um, the pages look like this. This would be one. Um, this might be a duck. This might be a walleye. This might be, you know, you can use them for just migratory birds or you can use them for everything. It's got the customer's name. It's got all the information that corresponds to your tag, which the DNR wants to see. So it's got their name, the date, address, city, state, zip, species, number of, date of kill, all of that. This is not required by law. It's the amount cost, but it's helpful if they're making payments, for instance. You can write down, they wrote a check on such and such a date. Um, you can write the balance in there. You can write the, the check number in there. If you want a sketch to give you an idea, jog your memory of what you're supposed to be doing for this person, you can um, make yourself a little sketch in here. It's got the tag number, which would be a number that would be on your tag, as well as the license number. Um, everything that you're gonna need to keep yourself legal. We have customers, or sometimes students, sometimes tax terms, every few weeks that call and say, God, a game warden was here and he, you know, I got a ticket for this or I got a ticket for that. Um, we had a tax term several years ago that did not fill out his tags properly. Um, fill these out, keep your animals tagged. Um, you're gonna be in the good graces of your DNR and they will be happy with you and you will feel confident. Okay, right, I think we're gonna go to well, let's pick another share from last week. Um, make sure to share the video, you guys, to be in the chance to win for next week. And let's go uh, Derek Harriman, Mike Phillips, or Craig Stoken, whichever one of you is watching. Or you said Craig, didn't you? And while we're waiting, I think I'm just going to see how my little freezer's doing. Oh, yeah. I go to my little app on my phone. And... Does it say full? I am. No 11, more? Ooh, I'm 11 degrees below zero. <laughs> Dave Brello, are you watching? Man. Full. All right, well, I guess you get to pick a number because no one's watching oh, live. That shared did they all that I have their numbers. Quit? Well, I just picked a few. Um, all right, I'm going to write it down for you. Okay. Between what are we doing? Um, go ahead and pick a number. Between? One and 20. All right, here it is. Secret. Okay, okay right, guys, start here. guessing. One through 20. One through 20. For a record keeping system? And if for a record keeping system. Um, let me do that. Um, let's talk about the clay clay. So this is something that people haven't, um, it's not in the catalog that you would see, but um, we are carrying it. It's in stock and it comes in one pound and four pounds. So why people are kind of guessing on that. Um, oh, got it. Okay. Somebody come up. Whoa, got it. Um, so the clay epoxy putty. I asked people what they thought of it. Ben Jones says he, I use a bit of epoxy scope for my replica antlers for repairing minor imperfections and seams. Um, Holly says she loves it. Rick Dunlop says it works great. Um, wear with gloves when working with it. Let's see, who else? Um, Cecil says more, it's more of a natural gray. Um, Delbert says, Works with epoxy solvent and denatured alcohol. A lot of people are saying they use it with rubbing alcohol and have no issues. Um, they mix part A and B well. Then they start adding colors to the tint. Um, someone said they use red flock for the inner nostril work. Works best with magic sculptor natural. 
Um, yes, it's awesome. Just remember, it's a lot faster cure time versus whatever you've been using. Also, you use 99% alcohol. Don't mix up more than what you're gonna get used up in. 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. minutes. You've got about 10 minutes of working time, max. And then you'll want to move on. Make so sure a golf cool. ball and a golf ball is too much. But a lot of people are using it and loving it. And one of the nice things, so this is by Rick Crane, and we are exclusive with him selling it. So you can only get it through Angler's Artistry or Matuska Tax for me, which is always exciting. We're excited about that. Great yeah. new product. And it looks like David Brella was present, so we will give the winner to him for the record-keeping system. Good job. And then start wa watching in your for the catalog in your mailbox, and we will be mm -hmm. live next Thursday going over sales, closeout items. And what about your little photo contest for the catalog? Oh, we did do that. We have that on Facebook. So the first 10, is it 10? Five. 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 First five to take a selfie and show us your picture. Everybody got so creative last year. And what we did is we kind of let our employees, once it got going, pick their favorite for an extra one, but we will give a little and extra that was fun. money. It was. We have so lots of cool pictures. Account. Everybody should have a, they got a warm up last year. We should get some really cool stuff. I think so. That's I think fun. so. So watch for that. It should be coming, I'd say, if not next week, the week after. Um, and let us know if you have any questions. We'll go live next week. And also another thing with next week, we are going to be doing a Black Friday sale. So watch for that. But it's only selected items. And it is first come, first serve. So if you don't get on that sale right away and take advantage of it, you will probably have a shipping because there will be a back order because people go crazy over it. So make sure to stay up on that and we'll do it Thursday, Thursday night sometime when the kiddos go down. <laughs> I get to go to Frozen today. It's in the Whoa. theater, so that's what we're doing. So we are out, but thanks for tuning in and give us a call 1-800-488-3256 or visit us online at www.machuscataxerunion.com. Good job, girls. Thank you.